hands of the potter with a clay soft and new a vessel takes its shape with every turn and view each crease and every line molded by his grace though the process may be painful he's forming something great on the potter's wheel we are spinning round and round Ever have one of those experiences, you know, where you question if it was real or not? Like something truly unexplainable. Oh, yeah, definitely. Ah, that's exactly what we're diving into today. Okay. Personal experience versus belief. Right. Especially when it comes to things we just can't quite wrap our heads around. I like it. And to make things even more interesting, we're throwing in um, a chilling encounter. Okay. With something that at least our subject believes was a demon. Hmm. And to add even more intrigue to the mix, yeah, we'll be looking at it through the lens of faith. Okay, with that healthy dose of skepticism. You know? Always important, right? Got to have that balance. Exactly. So buckle up because this one's a wild ride. All right, I'm ready. What's the source material this time? This time we're diving into a truly unnerving story straight from the depths of Reddit. Ooh, Reddit, always a treasure trove. And to add another layer. We'll be juxtaposing that with some intriguing biblical excerpts about demons and the whole shebang of spiritual warfare. All right, so we're talking personal experience, ancient beliefs, and maybe some modern interpretations. You got it. I'm thinking this is going to be a fascinating look at how these different perspectives kind of bounce off each other. Yeah, sounds fascinating. I'm really interested to see how these sources intertwine. Like, what kind of dialogue can we spark between them? Right. Okay, so let's jump right into it. Let's do it. Picture this. The Ozark Mountains. Oh, okay, beautiful scenery. Right, those rolling hills, those close-knit communities. But here's the thing. What's that? It's a place steeped in lore. Stories whispered around campfires about cursed lands. Okay, getting chills already. And that's where our narrator's family decided to settle. Oh, no good can come from this. In an old house with a story to tell. You know there's always that one house. <laughs> always. Yep. So you've got the setting, right? Now imagine... Our narrator, at just 13 years old. 13? Oh, that's young. He wakes up in the middle of the night, but he can't move a muscle. Sleep paralysis. You got it. Terrifying on its own, right? Absolutely. But then he sees it. Sees what? Something in the room with him. Oh, come on. In the dark. You can't just leave me hanging like that. On the couch, he sees this shadowy form, almost totally featureless. Okay, okay, so we're dealing with something undefined, something beyond the veil, maybe. But there's one horrifying detail he could make out. What is it? A skull face, staring right at him. A skull? No way! And get this, the eyes are blue. Just piercing, bulging blue eyes. Oh, that's just creepy. This whole thing is giving me the chills. Right. I mean, sleep paralysis alone is terrifying. Absolutely. Just the feeling of being trapped like that. But then to see that, to have that be the thing you see. Yeah, that just adds a whole other level of terrifying. Totally. But here's where things get really heartbreaking. The narrator. He wasn't the only one affected. What do you mean? His dad, a devout Christian, starts acting really strangely around the same time. Strangely how? He becomes convinced that something evil is in the house. That they're being targeted by some demonic force. Oh, so he believed it wasn't just a bad dream or anything. He thought it was real. Yeah, and, you know, this wasn't some flighty guy easily spooked. He was a man of faith deeply rooted in his beliefs. So what did he do? Did he just, like, ignore it, try to pray it away? This is where things get even more intense. He decides to confront whatever he believes is in the house head on. Whoa, hold on. Confronted it, like, yeah. directly. What did he do? He starts yelling at this unseen presence, invoking the name of Jesus, demanding it to leave. Wow. Talk about standing your ground. Right. But here's the really tragic part. Like, Shortly after this confrontation, yeah. his health takes a turn for the worse. He's diagnosed with this really aggressive form of cancer. Oh, man, that's awful. And the timing of it all, too, it makes you wonder. Doesn't it? It makes you wonder about cause and effect, you know? Mm -hmm. Was this truly some external force messing with their lives, or could it be something else? Right, like maybe a manifestation of something internal, something psychological. Exactly. It's amazing what the mind can do right. It really is. Like, think about sleep paralysis for a second. Oh, man. Don't even get me started. It can really mess with your head, make you see things, hear things. Especially when you're already stressed out or anxious. With Absolutely. It. And in those moments, those hallucinations, 
they feel so real. And you know, in this story with the narrator and his dad, it sounds like they were dealing with some heavy stuff already. You said it! Yeah. And then the dad gets hit with this cancer diagnosis. Yeah, talk about adding fuel to the fire. It really makes you question the timing of it all, doesn't it? It does. So are we saying this demon, if that's what it was, actually caused the cancer? Or are we venturing into, like, correlation doesn't equal causation territory here? That's the million-dollar question, isn't it? It's so easy to connect those dots to see a supernatural cause and effect. Especially when you're dealing with something as scary and unexplainable as a demon, right? Exactly. But we have to be careful not to jump to conclusions. We have to consider the psychological impact of what this family went through, especially the narrator. You're talking about the grief. Right. Yeah. Losing a parent at such a young age. Exactly. That kind of loss can be incredibly powerful, even warp your perception of things. So you're saying maybe the way he saw his dad's illness, maybe even his dad's appearance, was influenced by all that fear and grief. It's definitely a possibility we have to consider. And there's one more detail that throws another wrench in the works. Okay, hit me with. Years later, the narrator's sister comes forward. The sister. What did she have to say? She reveals that she also saw something strange in that house when they were kids. No way. So it wasn't just him. Does that lend more credibility to the idea that it was something, you know, supernatural? It definitely muddies the waters, right? Now we have two people with similar experiences, but then again, could it be a shared delusion, a product of the environment they were in? It's hard to say for sure. Talk about a head scratcher. So where do we even go from here? We've got this intense personal story, but how do we reconcile that with, well, a more research perspective? We touched on the biblical excerpts about demons and spiritual warfare earlier. Can you break that down for us? What do these ancient texts actually say about demonic entities? Well, one thing's for sure, the Bible doesn't shy away from demons. They're definitely presented as a reality. Okay, so we're not dealing with some vague, open to interpretation concept here. The Bible straight up says demons exist straight up. And the general understanding is that they're fallen angels, spiritual beings who rebelled against God. Fallen angels, huh? Like they were on God's side and then went rogue. So what are they doing now? Just hanging out, causing trouble? Well, the Bible suggests that the rebellion has some serious consequences in the real world. That's where this whole concept of spiritual warfare comes into play. Spiritual warfare. That sounds intense. Is it like demons with swords battling angels in the clouds? What are we talking about here? Well, not quite like that. It's not a physical battle in the literal sense. The Bible talks about putting on the full armor of God, but it's a metaphor. Okay, so if it's not actual armor, what is it? It's about being spiritually prepared, equipped to deal with negative spiritual forces. So more like internal armor, like building up your spiritual resilience. That's a good way to put it. The Bible emphasizes things like faith, truth, righteousness. These are presented as weapons in this spiritual battle. So if we're looking at that Reddit story through this lens, the dad kind of went against that whole spiritual preparedness thing, didn't he? He went straight for the confrontation. It's an interesting contrast, isn't it? You've got this devout Christian actively engaging in what he believes to be spiritual warfare. But why was he seemingly vulnerable to this demonic influence in the first place? These are questions that have puzzled theologians for centuries. It's like we're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm trying to make sense of something that just defies explanation. It is a puzzle, isn't it? And maybe that's the point. Maybe there aren't always easy answers when it comes to these things. But where does that leave us? I mean, we've got this guy on Reddit convinced he saw a demon, his dad believing it too, and then this whole biblical perspective on spiritual warfare. It's a lot to unpack, that's for sure. But I think the key takeaway here, the thing I always come back to, is the importance of approaching these topics with an open mind, but a critical eye. So not just blindly accepting everything we hear, but also not dismissing it outright. Exactly. It's about finding that balance between belief and skepticism. Because whether we interpret these experiences through a supernatural lens or a psychological one, they all tap into something very primal, very human. Our fear of the unknown. That's so true. We're naturally drawn to the things we don't understand, the things that go bump in the night. We crave explanations, especially for things that scare us. We want to make sense of the chaos. 
And in a way, isn't that what makes these stories, these experiences so universally compelling? Yeah. That element of mystery, of the unexplainable. Absolutely. It forces us to confront the limits of our own understanding. And maybe, just maybe, it pushes us to look inward as well. Look inward? How so? Well, if we entertain the possibility, even for a moment, that these experiences, whether they're real or imagined, reflect something deeper, it begs the question, what are our demons? Not literally, of course, but metaphorically speaking. What are the things that haunt us, the fears we wrestle with, the shadows we try to outrun? Whoa, you're really making us think here. What are our personal demons? That's a powerful question. It is, isn't it? And it's one that I think deserves more attention, more exploration. Because maybe, just maybe, by understanding our own personal demons, we can start to make sense of the bigger picture. That's quite a thought to end on. Really makes you think about the things we're afraid of, the things we don't understand, and how we choose to face them. Exactly. Well, that's about all the time we have for today's deep dive. But for all of you listening, we want to hear from you. Have you ever had an experience that left you questioning everything? Something you just couldn't explain? Head over to our social media and share your story. Until next time, keep exploring the unexplained. In the hands of the potter, where the clay is soft and new. A vessel takes its shape with every turn and view, each crease and every line molded by his grace. Though the process may be painful, he's forming something great. On the potter's wheel, we're spinning round and